Theophil Ashley was an artist by profession, a cattle painter by force of environment. It is not to be supposed that he lived on a ranch or a dairy farm in an atmosphere pervaded with horn and hoof, milking stool and branding iron. His home was in the park-like villa-dotted district that only just escaped the reproach of being suburban. On one side of his garden there abutted a small picturesque meadow in which an enterprising neighbour pastured some small picturesque cows of the Channel Island persuasion. At noonday, in summer time, the cows stood knee-deep in tall meadow grass, under the shade of a group of walnut trees, with the sunlight falling in dappled patches on their mouse-sleek coats. Eshley had conceived and executed a dainty picture of two reposeful milk cows in a setting of walnut tree and meadow grass and filtered sunbeam, and the Royal Academy had duly exposed the same on the walls of its summer exhibition. The Royal Academy encourages orderly, methodical habits in its children. Ashley had painted a successful and acceptable picture of cattle drowsing picturesquely under walnut trees, and, as he had begun, so of necessity he went on. His noontide piece, a study of two dun cows under a walnut tree, was followed by a midday sanctuary, a study of a walnut tree, with two dun cows under it. In due succession there came Where the Gadflies Cease From Troubling, The Haven of the Herd, and A Dream in Dairyland, Studies of Walnut Trees and Dun Cows. His two attempts to break away from his own tradition signal failures, Turtle Doves Alarmed by Sparrowhawk, and Wolves on the Roman Campagna, came back to his studio in the guise of abominable heresies, and Ashley climbed back into grace and the public gaze with a shaded nook where drowsy milkers dream. On a fine afternoon in late autumn, he was putting some finishing touches to a study of meadow weeds when his neighbour, Adela Pinsford, had sailed the outer door of his studio with that loud peremptory knockings. There is an ox in my garden, she announced, in explanation of the tempestuous intrusion. An ox, said Ashley, blankly, and rather fatuously. What kind of ox? Oh, I don't know what kind, snapped the lady. We call it a garden ox, to use the slang expression. It's the garden part of it that I object to. My garden has just been put straight for the winter, and an ox roaming about in it won't improve matters. Besides, there are the chrysanthemums just coming into flower. How did it get into the garden? asked Ashley. I imagine it came in by the gate, said the lady impatiently. It couldn't have climbed the walls, and I don't suppose anybody dropped it from an aeroplane as a bovril advertisement. The immediately important question is not how it got in, but how to get it out. Won't it go? said Ashley. If it was anxious to go, said Adela Pingsford rather angrily, I should not have come here to chat with you about it. I am practically all alone. The housemaid is having her afternoon out, and the cook is lying down with an attack of neuralgia. Anything that I may have learned at school or in after life about how to remove a large ox from a small garden seems to have escaped from my memory now. All I could think of was that you were a near neighbour and a cattle painter, presumably more or less familiar with the subject that you painted and that you might be of some slight assistance. Possibly I was mistaken. I paint dairy cows, certainly, admitted Ashley, but I cannot claim to have any experience in rounding up stray oxen. I've seen it done in the cinema film, of course, but there were always horses and lots of other accessories. Besides, one never knows how much of these pictures were faked. Adela Pinsford said nothing, but led the way to her garden. It was normally a fair-sized garden, but it looked small in comparison with the ox. A huge, mottled brute, dull red about the head and shoulders, passing to dirty white on the flanks and hindquarters, with shaggy ears and large, bloodshot eyes. It bore about as much resemblance to the dainty paddock heifers that Essie was accustomed to paint as the chief of a Kurdish nomad clan would to a Japanese shop girl. Ashley stood very near the gate, 
where he, while he studied the animal's appearance and demeanour. Adela Pinsford continued to say nothing. It's eating a chrysanthemum, said Ashley at last, when the silence had become unbearable. How observant you are, said Adela bitterly. You seem to notice everything. As a matter of fact, it's got six chrysanthemums in its mouth at the present moment. The necessity for doing something was becoming imperative. Ashley took a step or two in the direction of the animal, clapped his hands, and made noises of the hish and shoo variety. If the ox heard them, it gave no outward indication of the fact. If any, if any hens should ever stray into my garden, said Adela, I should certainly send for you to frighten them out. You shoo beautifully. Meanwhile, do you mind trying to drive that ox away? That is a Mademoiselle Louis Bichot that he's begun on now, she added, in icy calm, as a glowing orange head was crushed into the huge munching mouth. Since you have been so frank about the variety of the chrysanthemum, said Ashley, I don't mind telling you that this is an Ayrshire ox. The icy calm broke down. Adela Pingsford used language that sent the artist instinctively a few feet nearer the ox. He picked up a pea-stick and flung it with some determination against the animal's mottled flanks. The operation of mashing Mademoiselle Louis Bichot into a petal salad was suspended for a long moment while the ox gazed with concentrated inquiry at the stick-thrower. Adela gazed with equal concentration and more obvious hostility at the same focus. As the beast neither lowered its head nor stamped its feet, Ashley ventured on another javelin exercise with another pea-stick. The ox seemed to realize at once that it was to go. It gave a hurried final pluck at the bed where the chrysanthemums had been, and strode swiftly up the garden. Ashley ran to head it towards the gate, but only succeeded in quickening its pace from a walk to a lumbering trot. With an air of inquiry, but with no real hesitation, it crossed the tiny strip of turf at the charitable, called the croquet lawn, and pushed its way through the open French window into the morning room. Some chrysanthemums and other autumn herbage stood around the room in vases, and the animal resumed its browsing operations. All the same, Ashley fancied that the beginnings of a hunted look had come into its eyes, a look that counselled respect. He discontinued his attempt to interfere with its choice of surroundings. Mr. Ashley, said Adela in a shaking voice, I asked you to drive that beast out of my garden, but I did not ask you to drive it into my house. If I must have it anywhere on the premises, I prefer the garden to the morning room. Cattle drives are not in my line, said Ashley, if I remember. I told you so at the outset. I quite agree, retorted the lady, painting Pretty pictures of pretty little cows is what you're suited for. Perhaps you'd like to do a nice sketch of that ox, making itself at home, in my morning room. This time, it seemed as if the worm had turned. Ashley began striding away. Where are you going? screamed Adela. To fetch implements, was the answer. Implements? I won't have you use a lasso. The room will be wrecked if there's a struggle. But the artist marched out of the garden. In a couple of minutes he returned, laden with easel, sketching stool, and painting materials. Do you mean that you're going to sit quietly down and paint that brute while it's destroying my morning room? gasped Adela. It was your suggestion, said Ashley, setting his canvas in position. I forbid it! I absolutely forbid it! stormed Adela. I don't see what's standing you have in the matter, said the artist. You can hardly pretend it's your ox, even by adoption. You seem to forget that it's in my morning room, eating my flowers, came the raging retort. You seem to forget that the cook has neuralgia, said Ashley. She may be just dozing off into a merciful sleep, and your outcry will waken her. Consideration for others should be the guiding principle of people in our station of life. For man is mad! exclaimed Adela tragically. A moment later, it was Adela herself who appeared to go mad. 
The orcs had finished the vase flowers and the cover of Israel Kalish, and appeared to be thinking of leaving its rather restricted quarters. Ashley noticed its restlessness and promptly flung it some bunches of Virginia creeper leaves as an inducement to continue the sitting. I forget how the proverb runs, he observed. Uh, something about better a dinner of herbs than a stalled ox where hate is. You seem to have all the ingredients for the proverb ready for ha ready to hand. I shall go to the public library and get them to telephone for the police, announced Adela, and, raging audibly, she departed. Some minutes later, the ox, awakening probably to the suspicion that oil cake and chopped mangold was waiting for it in some appointed buyer, stepped, with much precaution, out of the morning room, stared with grave inquiry at the no longer obtusive and pea-stick-throwing human, and then lumbered heavily but swiftly out of the garden. Ashley packed up his tools and followed the animal's example, and Larkdeen was left to neuralgia and the cook. The episode was the turning point in Ashley's artistic career. His remarkable picture, Ox in a Morning Room, Late Autumn, was one of the sensations and successes of the next Paris Salon, and when it was subsequently exhibited at Munich, it was bought by the Bavarian government, in the teeth of the spirited bidding of three meat extract firms. From that moment, his success was continuous and assured, and the Royal Academy was thankful two years later to give a conspicuous position on its walls to his large canvas, Barbary Apes Wrecking a Boudoir. Ashley presented Adela Pingsford with a new copy of Israel Kalish, and a couple of finely flowering plants of Madame André Bisset, but nothing in the nature of a real reconciliation has taken place between them. <laughs>